Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. Hope you're all having a great day so far. And if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Welcome to episode 13 of my third season. Today is Wednesday, July 28th, 2021. My name is Sonal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now, I wanted to continue thanking all my fabulous guests these past seasons. These folks have made an impact in my opinion, and I'm happy all of their amazing stories, their insights are appreciated by all my listeners. So I'm continuously humbled and ever so grateful that this podcast has made it into the top 50 already in the Apple Podcasts charts. Paint the Medical Picture podcast has recently ranked at number 30, my highest ever in the U.S. Now, it looks like just about 56% of you listen in on iPhones. So thank you all for your continued downloads and keep those reviews and five-star ratings coming on in. Now, in my compliance tip today, I dive into polysomnography or sleep studies. And I also discuss the months criminal and civil enforcement cases involving fraud, waste, and abuse in the month of July. And I round out today's episode with a remarkable quote on journeys from 19th century American poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and recommendations based on my 10 years of experience in front office back-end, coding, and billing for multi-specialty physicians, compliance, and auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So, let's get into Newsworthy, the month's fraud, waste, and abuse cases. The month of July saw 41 cases as of the recording of this episode. Early July saw a regional hospital system resolving allegations under the False Claims Act and will pay $21.25 million for alleged improper relationships with certain referring physicians, which resulted in the submission of false claims to the Medicare program. Early July also saw a children's hospital agreeing to pay $27 million to settle allegations once again under the False Claims Act that between November of 2014 and October of 2016, it knowingly sold defective heart devices to healthcare facilities that, in turn, implanted these faulty devices into patients insured by federal healthcare programs. Mid July saw a multi state coalition of attorneys general in a settlement with a large pharmaceutical company for overcharging state Medicaid programs for drugs. Under the settlement, the big pharma company has agreed to pay $75 million to resolve these allegations. One state Medicaid program will in fact receive over $1 million in restitution and other recovery. And mid-July also saw a federal grand jury return an indictment, which charged a president of a company as well as another employee of a company whose main mission purported to empower men and women into becoming healthcare providers. But they were indicted for their roles in fraud conspiracy, which in fact sold fake nursing degrees to people who had not completed the required nursing coursework nor their clinicals. There were also many of the usual suspects like opioids distributors, kickbacks, bribery schemes, fraudulent DME billings, and money laundering. But I'd like to highlight two cases 
that I find most interesting. First, this case involves a national electroencephalography and EEG testing company who will pay $13.5 million to resolve allegations that it submitted or caused to be submitted false claims to federal health care programs that resulted from kickbacks to referring physicians or that sought payment for work not performed or for which only a lower level of reimbursement was in fact justifiable. The settlement also resolves allegations against a private investment company who will pay over $1.8 million for causing false billings resulting from the kickback scheme through its management agreement with the EEG company. Now, there's an acting assistant attorney general on the case who stated, quote, kickbacks and inflated billings result in the misuse of critical federal health care program funds, end quote. He later goes on and states, quote, the Department of Justice will collaborate with our agency partners to protect federal health care programs by pursuing those who knowingly claim public funds to which they are not entitled, end quote. Now, further details include the facts that the EEG company provides ambulatory EEG testing services for patients referred by physicians and other healthcare providers to diagnose certain neurological conditions. Now, the United States alleges that this company induced physicians to order the company's EEG testing by providing kickbacks in the form of free EEG test interpretation reports, thereby enabling primary care physicians who are not neurologists to bill the government as if they, in fact, had interpreted the tests. The government also alleges that the company used an inaccurate billing code for certain EEG testing to generate higher reimbursements and billed for a specialized digital analysis that it did not actually perform. Now, the government also further alleges that the investment company learned of these kickbacks based on their due diligence it performed prior to investing in the EEG company, but then caused false billings by allowing that conduct to continue once it entered into the official agreement to manage the EEG company. Now, the second case involves a clinical laboratory who has agreed to pay over $1.2 million to resolve civil allegations that it violated the False Claims Act. Now, according to the settlement agreement, the United States alleged three issues relating to claims for urine drug testing services that were submitted to Medicare, various state Medicaid programs, TRICARE, and the CHAMP VA. Now, first, the U.S. alleges that the lab submitted claims that misrepresented the number of drug classes tested. And specifically from January 2016 through September 2018, the lab submitted claims for definitive urine drug tests consisting of 22 or more drug classes. The United States also alleges that these claims were false because the lab tested for fewer than 22 drug classes. So by billing as if they tested for a greater number of classes, the lab therefore secured higher reimbursement to which it was not entitled. Second, the U.S. alleges that from January 2016 through December 2017, the, the lab submitted certain claims without sufficient documentation to support the treating medical physician's intent to order the test that was billed. And again, by billing for these tests, the lab again secured reimbursements to which it was not entitled. And finally, third, the U.S. alleges that the lab billed Medicare for specimen validity testing, which is a quality control process used to analyze a urine specimen to ensure that it has not been diluted nor altered. Now, since January of 2014, Medicare's guidance has stated that specimen validity testing with urine drug tests should not be separately billed to Medicare. The U.S. alleges that the lab still submitted claims to Medicare for specimen validity testing during the periods of October 2014 through May of 2016. 
Now, because the lab did self-disclose their misconduct, it was in fact able to resolve its liability for only one and a half times the amount of monetary loss caused by its false claims. By statute, the False Claims Act imposes a liability for three times the amount of loss suffered by the government. All right, wow. So these showcase pieces this month are both unique from a coder's perspective. The types of services are vastly different and fall into different sections in the CPT coding manual. Nonetheless, seasoned certified coders and compliance professionals understand the deeper nuances of EEG codes and the scope of practice required in interpreting those reports. And of course, those urine drug tests and specimen validity testing have been wreaking havoc for years now, right? In both the federal and commercial payer landscape. It's important to stay on top of all your payer policies in both EEG and urine drug testing. From my experience, it's, it's often true that when Medicare makes a big update or a big change, the commercial payers may soon follow in similar fashion. So I always believe these types of fraud, waste, and abuse cases are most helpful. Take a deeper look into these reports and see how they may affect you, your provider, your facility. Start self-auditing your service claims and coordinating documentation to ensure you are meeting compliance. And now it's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. Now, I've addressed sleep studies, polysomnography, in season one as well. So it's pretty clear to me that the OIG continues to see a need to educate providers on coverage and proper billing for polysomnography. CMS has some good fact sheets available for physicians and other practitioners who write prescriptions for polysomnography. So let's get into some background details. Now, in a study conducted by the Office of the Inspector General, that's our OIG, of course, it was found that from January 1st of 2014 through December 31st of 2015, max nationwide paid freestanding facilities, which are facilities affiliated with hospitals, as well as physicians, approximately $800 million for selected polysomnography, which is again a sleep study, right? To diagnose and evaluate sleep disorders. Now, some of the reasons for those denials include that in previous OIG reviews for polysomnography services found that Medicare paid for services that did not meet Medicare requirements. Now, these reviews identified payments for services with inappropriate diagnosis codes without the required supporting documentation and to providers that exhibited patterns of questionable billing. Now, throughout their audit, the OIG estimated that Medicare made overpayments of roughly $269 million for polysomnography services during that audit period. Now, these errors occurred because the CMS oversight of polysomnography services was insufficient to ensure that providers complied with Medicare requirements and to prevent payment of claims that did not meet those requirements. Now, documentation requirements include the facts that, number one, CMS requires an order from the provider who treats the beneficiary for all diagnostic tests, including polysomnography. And second, polysomnography providers must enter the name and the national provider identifier number, the NPI, of this ordering provider on the polysomnography claim. And third, polysomnography is covered only if the beneficiary has the symptoms or complaints of narcolepsy, sleep apnea, impotence, or parasomnia, which must again be documented and reflected in the medical record. And remember, polysomnography for chronic insomnia is not covered. Now, to prevent claims denials, it's very good to know that Medicare will cover polysomnography when certain criteria are met. Like number one, if the clinic is either affiliated with a hospital 
or is under the direction and control of physicians. Medicare may cover diagnostic testing routinely performed in sleep disorder clinics, even in the absence of direct supervision by a physician. And second, beneficiaries are referred to the sleep disorder clinic by their attending physicians, and the clinic maintains a record of the attending physician's orders. And third, Medicare will cover polysomnography if there's medical evidence that confirms the need for diagnostic testing, like in the physician examinations and laboratory tests. And of course, be mindful though, that diagnostic testing that is duplicative of previous testing done by the attending physician simply is not covered because Medicare does not consider it to be reasonable and necessary. So it's important to stay awake, <laughs> right? It's important to stay awake and be mindful of maintaining compliance for our provider documentation in sleep studies. These facts are a very, very good reminder that you should be making checklists and improving workflows and efficiencies at your practice to ensure all documentation is being captured. Coding and billing are compliant for all applicable statutory and regulatory guidelines. These OIG audits for polysomnography have been going on for many years, so we must do better. We must be mindful that our provider documents their clinical documentation accordingly, and they're capturing with complete accuracy of the patient's medical condition. So a better, smarter approach is one that's proactive and starts by painting a clear, rich, and vibrant medical picture the first time so your certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from the great Ralph Waldo Emerson. To finish the moment, to find the journey's end in every step of the road, to live the greatest number of good hours is wisdom. Absolutely true, right? I think this is a perfect quote that reminds us, inspires us. We have all started our journeys with small steps. We have all taken a few weeks, a few months, a few years in each of our many journeys. At the end of each one, we gain the clarity, the wisdom of lessons learned. We can take those lessons learned that wisdom and apply it again for our next big adventure. I am happy Emerson's spark still shines on in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. Please go out and make this a great day, an incredible week for yourselves. Aim a little higher, do a little more, and give back in any way you can in 2021. There's so much each one of us can do. And in my final note now, In this new COVID-19 surge that we're all being affected by, it's spreading pretty aggressively now, right? In states nationwide. So please try, please stay vigilant. I know it's hard, it's summertime, and we're all so, so tired. But let's do our part and keep washing up, masking up, and staying physically distant. As always, I appreciate you diving into today with me. And if you want more information from me, go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please continue staying safe and healthy, practice safety for one and all during our collective life in the time of coronavirus. Thank you so much for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.